Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Taft. This podcast is the full show from today's episode of Undisputed from start to finish. We've got a busy slate, so skip Shannon. Let's get to it. I'm Jason McIntyre, back with Chris Broussard and LeVar Arrington. Good morning, fellas. What up? What up? What up, Chris? What's up, fellas? All right. It, it is my pleasure to continue teaching you guys this week. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not learning anything. Let's start here. An early playoff exit left LeBron and the Lakers with numerous questions. After trading for Russell Westbrook to stand alongside King James and AD, the purple and gold brought back former players in Dwight Howard and Trevor Ariza. L.A. also nabbed young guards Malik Monk and Kendrick Nunn. Finally, they cashed in on LeBron's banana boat buddy, Carmelo Anthony. All that remains to be seen is if L.A. has turned their questions into answers. All right, Chris Broussard, we'll start with you. Have the Lakers done enough to get LeBron back to the finals? Well, here's where I'm at on the Lakers. Uh, if you ask me the Lakers or the field in the West, I'm going with the field, all right, to get to the finals. But if you put a gun to my head and say you got to name one team in the West that you're picking as the favorite, I'm going with the Lakers. Obviously, the talent at the top of the roster is legendary. And then you still, you added Carmelo, who's a legend in his own right as an older player. So they've got the talent to get to the finals, but this team's got a few major questions The first of which, look, guys, we've talked about it. This is the granddaddy of all chemistry experiments. All right, so how is this team going to fit together? Westbrook, is he going to be comfortable off the ball playing with LeBron? What's the spacing with certain lineups going to be like? So there are a lot of questions in that regard is how these guys fit together on the floor. And Frank Vogel and that coaching staff is going to have their work cut out for them, figuring out what lineups to play together, how to divvy out the minutes. Because, look, all things considered, I mean, they didn't have much money to spend. They did a good job of filling out and rounding out this roster. But the second question is this one, and it's just as big as the first. These dudes are old. All right, this is an old team. This looks like... Uh, Team USA from 2012 or 2016. I mean, these brothers are old, and there's a serious question as to who's going to make it to the finish line for them. We look at LeBron as a Superman, and he has been that, and then some. But he will be 37 years old in December. In two of the past three seasons, he's ended with injury, And the one in which he made it through the entire year, they had a four-month layoff. All right? And then you got Anthony Davis, who is injury-prone. You know, and then the other guys are older as well. Dwight Howard, Carmelo Anthony. I get it. They won't play the same minutes that LeBron and AD do. But still, age could be a factor. And when we think about big threes, guys, in the history of the NBA, we tend to think about the ones that have had success. We think about Boston with Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce. We think about Miami, of course, with LeBron, D. Wade, and Chris Bosh. We think about Golden State with KD, Steph, and Clay. We don't think about the ones that failed, though. And there were several that failed. And the one thing every single one of them had in common was age. They were old. The Lakers brought together Wilt Chamberlain, Jerry West, and Elgin Baylor. They played three seasons together. No rings. Why? Because injuries. Elgin Baylor was out a lot. Wilt Chamberlain was out one season for the most part. Jerry West even had a few nagging injuries. Then you go to Houston. Charles Barkley, Hakeem Olajuwon, Clyde Drexler. They were old and nearing the end of their prime and they never got to the finals in two years together. They tried it again with Barkley, Olajuwon, Scottie Pippen, go out in the first round. The Lakers have done it a, a few more times. Remember when Carl Malone, Gary Payton, Kobe and Shaq came together? Now, Kobe and Shaq were still fairly young, but Payton and Malone were older. And when they got to the finals against Detroit, Carl Malone was banged up. And then remember, more recently, 
Dwight Howard, Steve Nash, Kobe, Pal Gasol. That team goes out in the first round. Nash is banged up. They never really get to the finish line because of the age. So when you bring together older players, you've got to worry about their age and their health, and then you've got to worry about how do they adjust to new roles. Because for their whole careers, they play one way. Their whole careers, they've been the focal points of their offense or their team. And now you're asking them to come together and accept the role and play differently than they have their entire career. So these are the major challenges that the Lakers face. And a lot has to go right for them to get to the finals. That's why I picked the field in the West. But it's open. It's wide open. And the Lakers are the most talented team out there. I don't know why you picked the field, Broussard. <laughs> I mean, again, they, they were the favorites to, to go this year. And they get injured. And they didn't have any of these guys. And, and you don't lose any guys in free agency that would say that they go a step back. I don't see anybody who did anything in the West definitively that says they took a step forward away from where the Lakers are currently. So I would still look at the Lakers as being the favorites. That's that's just what it is. Now you add the rest of Uncle Drew's crew to, to this deal. <laughs> and for me, I look at it from right, this perspective. Right, right. This is modern day basketball. This is modern day sports. One thing I will say the, the age-old arguments and discussion points that you're using and examples, they're, they're, they're dated. Yeah. They're very dated. And, and the reason why I'll say they're dated is because the, the way these guys train versus even when I was playing in, in the early 2000s to you know the, the first decade of it, it's different. It's a workout culture. These guys really, really do take care of themselves. They, they eat differently. They, they approach just the off seasons very different. And, and I don't look at age as being as egregious with these guys as I once would have in, in years before. I mean, we're looking at Tom Brady. Tom Brady's one of the highest rated players coming into this season. And he's also one of the oldest. So I'm not equating the, the, you know, the, the level of, of accomplishment or the level of, of competition to, to necessarily being too old to compete. This isn't even a big three setup. I look at this as a dream team setup, right? Because you're you've gone beyond a big three. You you brought in, you know, bringing in Dwight, now bringing in Carmelo and adding him, and you already have AD and LeBron. This is definitely going to come down to how you manage them. This is a managed situation. You know why? Because you have so much wisdom, you have so much experience, and you have still so much talent. And if I was looking at it from the, the standpoint of just injuries alone, well, everybody was injured this year. Everybody had a main player that was injured. And if I didn't or could have, would have, should have in terms of if they were healthy and they weren't old, they were young as well. So to me, when I look at this setup of this roster, yes, they're old. But don't overstate the fact that just because they're older, this isn't one of the most impressive collections in the history of the game of bringing guys together of bringing talent together to make a run for a one-time title yeah chris is so hung up on age age is nothing but a number chris okay oh, yes the lakers i got all the jokes over text message people around the league the lakers are going to lead the league in cholesterol <laughs> the lakers are so old all these jokes are flying and oh this is the best collection of talent and experience since the Golden Girls. And people are joking about the Lakers. I think they got six players aged 32 or older, which is a new uh, NBA record in the modern era. I eight, think the I Knicks, think it, had, it might be eight, I don't know, whatever. They got a lot of old dudes. Chris, it doesn't matter. You're missing the big picture. They perfectly rounded out this roster. They're without question the team to beat in the West because they got the perfect role players. Chris, we were concerned on Monday when... Russell Westbrook was the big haul, and they said they don't have the three-point shooting. We talked about that probably for 45 minutes on this show. What did Rob Palenka and LeBron go do? Go yes, and LeBron. They went, yeah, thank go you, LeVar. Mello. They added four guys who shot 40 or better from three last year. Four. And Kendrick Nunn was 38. Now, I know they don't have a ton of two-way players, but when you can go toggle between Kent Bazemore and Wayne Ellington. Oh, and let's bring in Malik Monk. He's going to drop 30 tonight. The Lakers 
are really, really stacked and role players, Chris. And I think that's what you're missing. This is LeBron's best team since 2017 when the, he had Kyrie Irving and they got smoked by the Golden State Warriors, who just happened to be the greatest team in the modern era. OK, this LeBron team is much better than the Lakers bubble team. Remember, their third best player on that team was KCP. OK, KCP went through it that year. We know he had his issues. They're way deeper than that Laker team from two years ago. And just one final word, Chris, on the injuries. LeVar eloquently put it, okay? Everybody was hurt in the playoffs last year. Trey Young goes down. Dante DiVincenzo goes down. Like, everybody lost somebody. The Lakers, by the way, added, I think, seven guys on minimum contracts, and they somehow hit a home run with, like, almost all of them. Kendrick Nunn took less money to play with this stacked Lakers team than go elsewhere and make more money. I just, Chris, I... I, I yeah, I don't want to be too mean. It's early in the show. But to say that the Lakers are not favorites in the West is just, you know, kind of going against conventional wisdom, facts, stats, I numbers, just said, Vegas numbers. Chris, come on. Did you listen to what I, I said? Yeah. I said, if you force me to pick a favorite in the that. West, did who did that. I say but it would no be? There's no need to force me. I said Chris, it would be the Lakers. Basic. Who's the best team right, in the, the West? Reason, I'm not the reason you to do I'm saying the, the reason I'm saying the field is because so much has to go right. LeBron, y'all, father time is undefeated. No, Do I, I have agree. to remind I you that everybody's Tom not saying. Tom Brady? Tom Brady, right? I don't disagree LeBron with what you're saying. LeBron is in his saying. 19th year. LeBron that, was an MVP that's all I'm candidate saying. I get this it. year, Chris. He was an MVP candidate early in the I season. I get it. Look, and he got hurt. That's my point. LeBron can still play. He may still be the best player in the world when he's playing. But it isn't a coincidence. I think the injuries that took him out in two of the last three years would not have taken him out five, six years ago. He would have handled those well, better. That's where Father Time's ankle. tapping him on the shoulder. Yeah, it's not so much his ankle. game. That's, that, he that he got bodies you know. into the ankle all the time early in his career, but he handled it. I'm t I, think, I think that's... Now, I'm not predicting he gets hurt. I'm just saying... As when age comes along, injuries are always an issue. And Anthony Davis isn't old. He's just injury prone. Mm. Period. Kyrie Irving is too. So the one year he so was the Kevin injury. Durant. Like, come the on. one year cannot know Kevin Durant's not I, anything I, like I, Anthony I, Davis. I, Stop. Kevin Durant has serious injuries that keep him out. Anthony Davis has nagging injuries that bother him all the time, and he misses games here and there. The one time he didn't, they had a four-month layoff. So, again, I like the – they are the favorites in the West. This is a, a crazy roster when you look at it. Although, I think when you say maybe the best <laughs> ever, LeVar, you're counting Dwight Howard in his prime, Carmelo Anthony in his prime. They're not there. But it I is an impressive roster on paper. It's an impressive roster on paper. I'm just saying – these guys got to stay healthy. And don't think LeBron and AD can sit out too much in the regular season because they need to play together with Westbrook to develop chemistry. They have to figure out how they're going to play. I mean, they're not just going to step on the floor and mesh like that. This is not a Brooklyn situation where even that was going to be a challenge, but James Harden could run the point the way he did, and those three guys, two guys around him, could shoot lights out. Now, you're talking, to, the stars don't shoot lights out for the Lakers. And you're talking about Malik Monk coming in, dropping 30 stoppage, J-Mac. Well, why he not? Why can't, he's done that before. Last year. Because he averaged, he's an 11-point score. That's ben what he Mac is. Ben McLemore came and into a Lakers at, game you're, last you're, year and hit six threes had, and a half. It happens with LeBron. This is what you Jay, do. You stack Jay LeBron's Mac, you gotta team let me with role players who can make shots. They had role players. They had 40% shooters from three last year. All right? Yeah, and they, they didn't shoot as well. But, but none, these are not, these are not Kyle Corvers. This is these are be not a Kyle Corvers. But you can't compare Kuzma and these guys yeah. from this past year to the type of Carmelo mentality Anthony, and right? mindset that they're bringing in. You know, with, with, with Carmelo, j just for an example, he's one of those guys that could have been on the level of LeBron when they came into the NBA. And he's always chased that, and he's probably always been haunted by it. 
but they're close friends as well. So when I look at guys like Melo or I look at guys like Dwight Howard, we got our best basketball out of Dwight Howard. We didn't hear craziness about things that he was doing or things he was feeling in that championship run with the Lakers. You bring in a Trevor Ariza. He's going to be one of those guys that he's he's bringing toughness to the table. He's a chippy guy. You bring in Russ, the same type of guy. I think the makeup of this group of guys, when I look at the field, they can get through this relatively unscathed. Because when I look at, okay, I love Utah. I always talk about Utah. What advantage does Utah have? We saw if Donovan gets, if Donovan goes down and he gets injured, which he does get injured, they're a different team. All right? You look at the clips. They're already coming in wounded. They're not. They're they're a step behind the yeah. Lakers oh, already no, yeah. with Kawhi. When I look at the other teams, Jamal Murray yeah. went out. How healthy is he going to be moving forward? They've made some moves, but when I look at the West and I look at the field, is it so crazy to think that? Well, having a true off season of rest, coming out of the bubble and getting another season. You go out of the playoffs relatively early, so now you've gotten a real restful time as LeBron and AD. AD's changed his trainers, his training staff, so he's doing things that he can do to make himself physically better prepared for the season. I just don't think it's egregious to look at this team and say, they're too old, so I'm going to take the field. And maybe it's by default, Broussard. Maybe I'm looking at the rest of the field, and I'm saying no one definitively made a move that says to me, oh, my gosh, like, you got to worry I about with that. them. Yeah. You got to worry about this team. There's no one who has done that that set themselves apart. So I look at the Lakers as saying they addressed it the way they needed to in order to be as competitive as they can possibly be for one season and one season alone. And just so people don't think I'm totally pro-Lakers here, there are some weaknesses, right, LeVar? I mean, I'm not really worried about the workload on LeBron. I'm more worried about the team doctor, you know, tending to all these elderly gentlemen on the roster. But in all seriousness, the rim protection could need a third guy. Okay, as you said, Anthony Davis is usually missing 15, 20 games a season. Dwight Howard, he's an ancient guy out there. They need a third rim protector because, well, truth be told, when Carmelo Anthony's on the court, you know, people are blown by him pretty easily. And Wayne Ellington, not known as a great defender. Malik Monk ranked 115th out of 116 shooting guards in defensive real plus minus. So a third rim protector would be nice. And Len, Chris, you know, one thing you haven't mentioned is Frank Vogel is going to have to manage some egos here because there are a lot of guys on this roster who may not like it if they don't play 10 minutes in a game or 20 minutes. Like, I don't know how Russ is going to handle if he has to take a back seat. Or Carmelo, hey, you're going to sit this one out, buddy. You're going to rest. Is Carmelo going to want to do that for a guy who hasn't been to the Western That's Conference Finals? It's an all-star team. Since That's 2009. what you do. It's an Man all-star it, yeah. team. LeVar's right. This is Man, better. Yeah. This is bigger than a, a big three. I'm sitting a big three guy down. You can't play. This is an all-star cast of players. Those guys are not going to be sitting there complaining if they're sitting out. You know what they're going to be doing? Icing a knee, <laughs> taking care, taking some uh, Advil, oh, making sure that they keeping that knee inflamed. They probably <laughs> dealing with a touch of arthritis of at this backs. point. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so they ain't going to be complaining. Look, look you're not going to have a problem with that. Now you, I'm, I agree. I don't look. I don't think it's going to be an ego problem. I even think Westbrook. I, I don't think he's a selfish player at all. I think the challenge for Westbrook is not going to be, I'll do whatever Trying it to takes. Because he went to Houston and was ready to do whatever it took playing next to James Harden. The challenge for Russ is going to be that your game is your game. Mm -hmm. He's been playing the same way his whole life. And obviously for his last 12 years or whatever it is of his NBA career, is he going to be able to adjust? Bro, let me ask I you mentioned this. that team when Gary Payton when Gary Payton wow. went to the Lakers. Let me he ask had you this, trouble adjusting to the triangle offense. He hated it, and he couldn't be himself. Yeah, but he Those had to play. are real he, concerns. Okay, okay. But, a but who was the coach? He at what? That, who was the coach at that time when Gary Payton? Phil came? Jackson. Okay, that's Phil a Jackson. much different animal. Than so pretty Dylan good. Coach. And by the way, the Lakers, right I believe, had gone to three straight finals. Chris, they, they were worn down when they added. No, they Mel lost Man the year before. And uh, and, and Gary they Payton. They lost the year who before. Who were straight up fossils? Who were like, I believe, 38, 39 years. 
numbers. But let me throw this one out at you guys. Their numbers were let, big the year let before. Let me throw this one out at you. Russell, Wilson, Russell Westbrook goes hard. He go, and we all know it. In fact, he right. physically will go harder than every single player on this roster that has been assembled, correct? We won't argue that, right? Is there a possibility that the idea of all of this is to do just that? Allow Russ to do Russ, and we fit around Russ because he's got the younger legs. He's got the vibrant approach. He's got the energetic approach. He's been great at what part of the season? The regular season. We got young legs to carry us through the regular season. Let's support him. Let's work to keep AD, our next young dude, keep him healthy during the course of this season. And by the time we get to the playoffs, we're rested and we're ready to go. I'm thinking LeBron is too smart. These guys are, are wily vets. Why not let Russ be who Russ is and let him do his thing during the course of this regular season and then move from there and see where we're at once we get to the My playoffs. My only concern with that, I largely agree with it, LeVar, is that Russ dominates the regular season, puts up great numbers, and then the playoffs come and, oh, we're going to reduce your minutes by 8 or 10. And you're not going to be able to do what you did during the regular season. It's like letting your kid play video games all during the week and then the weekend comes and you're like, no, let's do other stuff. And then your kid's like, no, 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 I played video games. I want to keep doing Not that. Not if I, it's LeBron James uh, well, and Carmelo the, Anthony and say, guys yeah. that you look up to and you respect from a hero's standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. It can work. That's the thing about it. It can work. I'm sorry. KD and, and Harden, KD and Harden are peers to Russ. They're peers. You know what, what Carmelo and LeBron are to Russ? Heroes. He's going to do whatever it takes because they are all chasing championships. There's only a few dudes on this team that have championships. There's only a few. So if you LeVar, look at a reason, you look here, at LeBron here. and you look at AD just getting one, why wouldn't you conform to trying to make this thing work? They're going to all be, be here's the, ready to go to make it work. Here's the problem. I agree. They Mentally, they will. But sometimes you're built to play a certain way, all right? And here's the problem with your theory about let Russ be Russ okay. and everybody blend in around him during the regular season. That's not how you're going to play in the playoffs. Russ is a, has been a bad how decision maker throughout his career. How many times did play together before they're they got to the playoffs? They're not going to let him. Seven. How many times they're did they not, play together Russ in is Brooklyn? Not, Russ is – Brooklyn was different. Those dudes could shoot. The three big three can shoot. Much. They're – they didn't play together They are very going much. to have to play. They are going to have to play in the regular season throughout their entire careers, adjusting to playing with Russell Westbrook and adjusting to playing with LeBron James takes time. That's not the same as James Harden, Kevin Durant, and Kyrie Irving. It's been, it's different. And Russ plays at such a hectic pace that you have to get used to playing with him. <laughs> so they can't just play one way in the regular pace. season and another way in the playoffs. Again, I'm with you that they're the favorites in the West. I'm just saying you guys are overstating a lot of the concerns that they have going in. 57 wins. Or understating. Number one say. seed in the West. I Come just love next. hectic pace. <laughs> no mercy. Early signs indicate Micah Parsons being an absolute game wrecker for the Cowboys. The former Penn State standout is already showing off his versatility in training camp as he's lining up at various linebacker positions as well as showing off his pass rushing skills. Parsons has the attention of Mike McCarthy, who described his young defensive stud as unique. LeVar, is your guy, Parsons, the key to turning around the Cowboys defense? He's, he's a major part. To, to the ingredients of making the key that does unlock the potential of what the, the Cowboys can be. Listen, I said this coming into the draft when he was coming out. Everybody asked me, what, what, who is Micah Parsons? What, what is he? What, what can he do? What can he be? I thought he was the best player in the draft overall, not because of my connection and relation to him, because I know what his capabilities are. I said this, I made a bold proclamation on the show yesterday, and I saw a couple people picked up on it. I said it's the best football player I've seen since I played with Sean Taylor. That's the first, he's the first kid I've seen, young man that I've seen, to the level of what he's capable of doing 
from the position that he plays that it, it <clears throat> made me draw comparisons. Like, who do I compare him to? Who does he remind me of, of what he's capable of doing? And it was Sean Taylor. Reason why, it's like Sean plays safety, Micah plays linebacker, but when you think about the things that Sean Taylor was able to do, Sean Taylor could play safety, both safety positions, both strong and free. He can cover like a free, he can hit you like a bag of bricks, like a strong. He can get in the box like a strong and play like a linebacker, or he can get out and play coverage. He can do all of those things. He was so versatile, he was sideline to sideline. When you look at Micah Parsons and what his skill sets are and what his strengths are and what he's capable of doing, it's the same exact thing, except it's the level, it's the level up and one more level forward. At the linebacking position, he can play all three linebacking spots. He can play on the inside, which means that he can play inside the tackles, make plays with guards, make plays against centers. He can get to the ball carrier, and he is one of the best at navigating and dis disengaging blockers. He's also able to get sideline to sideline. So if you think about like guys like a Brian Erlacher, who had the ability to be able to run from sideline to sideline from the, the inside of the defense, he can do all of those things at a Pro Bowl, you know, all pro level. If you put him on the outsides, you know, strong side, can you set an edge? Can you be a three down backer at the strong side? It's a different game than the weak side. Weak side, guys, it's more pass oriented. It's more off the ball. It's more play the run. He can do that. He's quick enough. He's fast enough. His, his, his decisiveness and being able to diagnose plays, his ability to, to antidote is, it's just, it's, a, it's, he's a different dude. He can cover man to man. He can do all those things. He can play on a tight end, man to man. He can do what a strong side backer does, which is more dirty work of the defense. It's more almost like an interior lineman, a, a defensive end added to your defense. But he can run as a defensive end. You can, you can actually, the kid was actually a defensive end in high school. He had to transition out of being a defensive end and move to a linebacker. A lot of what we saw from Pitt State linebacking Micah Parsons was even watered down because they probably couldn't figure out how exactly to use him. This is going to be the biggest key for, for McCarthy and for Quinn, and Quinn has admitted it as much. How do you use Micah Parsons? You, you have a strong linebacking core. You have a really, really strong defensive front as well that, that's coming together. How do you use Micah Parsons exactly? If they crack the code on where to use him and at the times to use him, you should see a, a really, really special, special player, a, a, a generational player on the defensive side of the ball. So a major key ingredient to if the Dallas Cowboys will have success this year. As a rookie. Look, I like the kid. I, I like the kid a lot. I don't think it's possible to like him as much as LeVar does, but, but I do like him. All right? I think <laughs> well, that the Cowboys him. hit at least a triple. They, they hit a triple with this. We'll see if it turns into a home run, but this was a good draft pick. You, you mentioned everything he can do. I mean, the kid, he's versatile. He's his size, 6'4", 250. He's got 4'3", four, 4'4", four, four speed. Do you understand you know, how crazy that is? That he runs a 4'3", 40. Right. That's in. He I ran didn't a four even three run a 4'3", nine, three right? coming out so, of college. The dude, the dude has all the ability to get it done. Saying he is the key is an overstatement. That's going too far. But I think he, as you said, Levar, he's one of the keys. I think Dan Quinn is a key. All right, I know he's the defensive coordinator. He won't be out there on the field, but he's a key. Dallas had the four years before Mike Nolan took over. They were in the top third of the league defensively. And a few times they were in the top ten, close to the top five. And Nolan comes in and complicates things, and they fall off. So I think Quinn coming back is a bit, or, you know, coming to Dallas, he's a great defensive coordinator. I think that's big. I think the other linebackers, Leighton Van Der Esch, I've mentioned, he's playing for a contract. I think that's going to be big. I think he'll be able to stay healthy Somehow guys have a, a way of staying healthy at times when they're playing for a contract. <laughs> All right, Jalen Smith, need, I need a good year out of him. Demarcus Lawrence, I need him to turn back the clock. When two years ago, he was, he was a pro bowler. I need him to get back to that level, which he hadn't played at 
the last couple of years. Trayvon Diggs, I think I'm expecting a big jump from him in this second season to really shore up that secondary. So there are a lot of keys to this defense succeeding. Micah Parsons, one of them, but it's going to take much more than him to make this defense what they need it to be. Yeah, as good as Parsons is, it's tough to put an entire burden on a 22-year-old rookie. I'm sure he's going to be great, but sorry, he's not one of the top three guys that's needed to perform on this defense. Oh, yes, I he think is. you guys missed this, okay? I know you guys don't oh, love the numbers. Yes, Pro Football Focus has the Cowboys secondary ranked 31st in the league, okay? They were a tire fire last year in the secondary. And a part of it is because they can't get to the quarterback. Other than Lawrence, they got nobody to rush the passer. And what does Jerry what, do? He didn't, oh, he didn't get to hey, the quarterback. We're, we're, we're going to get Alden Smith and Randy Gregory. That's what we're banking on. Two guys who you know, have had some problems off the field. If they can stay on the straight and narrow, I, I'm very optimistic for this front seven where Micah Parsons will be instrumental. But the key is, if you can't pressure the quarterback, that secondary is going to be under fire. They're ranked 31st for a reason. They went out and brought in two of Dan Quinn's guys, okay, from Atlanta, where the secondary wasn't good to begin with. And then they drafted uh, defensive backs in the second and third round. It's a clear position of need. Now, the good news is, and I know Cowboys fans are angry because of what I just said, the good news is they face a weak slate of quarterbacks this year. First of all, let's look at the division. Danny Dimes, I like to call him Danny Loose Change because he's a turnover machine. Mm. Ryan Fitzpatrick, you know, we know <laughs> what he is. And then, of course, Jalen Hurts who struggled and started, I believe, three or four games last year. So in the division, you four. could warm up. Now, they have a tough start opening with Tom Brady and Justin Herbert, but it gets much easier. So I believe they will struggle early. First two weeks, there will be panic. This show will go to DEFCON 2 on the Cowboys secondary, but they will be fine come October. And again, as much as we've laid into the Cowboys and they love talking about Jerry Jones and the struggles of McCarthy, this probably is an 11-win team capturing the NFC East thanks to a defense handling bad quarterbacks. This is what I'll say. I gave you guys the breakdown on who Michael Parsons is as, as a player. The reason why he will be a catalyst for change on this defense is because when you get players of his caliber, of his magnitude, and you have other guys, those other two linebackers, Van Der Esch and, and Jalen, are... They are nice. Like, coming out of college, I mean, listen, you didn't have a better linebacker coming out, out of college better than Jalen, like, right before that injury. He's gotten back from that injury, and he has been an efficient and an effective player for this team. But Micah is like, he's just different. I mean, he's different. And, and we'll probably look back on this show a year or two from now and be like, man, you, you sit it. It's, it's hard to explain when you see somebody that's that different. And that's why I use Sean as, as an example in doing so. So even with everything that we're talking about, I'm not even a Dallas fan. So I'm just giving you guys just straight up, straight up information. I am a big Michael Parsons fan because I have a personal relationship with him, but I'll never sacrifice the integrity of what I do as a professional. So if he was a good football player, I would say this is a good football player. If he was something less than that, it's like, ah, oh, we'll have to wait and see. He's a project kid. I would, I would say he's a project. They got to build him and see where we end up. He will be a major catalyst. He will emerge as like an Erlacher, like a... A uh, Mac, like a uh, Ray Lewis, he will emerge. A uh, Von Miller, he will emerge as an impact player on this team. And it's very far and few in between where you get guys that have the ability to impact games in a certain type of way, in a certain type of manner. Quinn knows this. And so now what Quinn is going to do is he's going to make sure that all of these complementary pieces the Jalen Smiths, the Van Der Eshes, the, the Marcus Lawrences. He just got off of the physically, uh, the pup list. He's getting healthy. This team is getting healthy. It's going to be an interesting dynamic watching what Quinn does with the schematics of this defense because if you keep it simple, and I know George Edwards is in that on that staff. He coached me when I played. So I've gotten some real insight to how they are preparing and planning to play this year on defense. 
It is a masterful approach as to what it is they're thinking they're going to do. So we can throw ratings of the defensive secondary out. You can look at if Alden Smith or Randy Gregory and those guys are going to be what they need to be. You have to throw all of those things out the door at this point if you're being smart about it. Because I think what Dan Quinn has put in store and put in front of this defensive unit has empowered them, has inspired them, and has motivated them. And I think with that understanding and that clarity, they're going to play faster. They're going to play with a chip on their shoulder. And it's going to be a difference maker for this team. And that's just where I'm at with it, with, with my evaluation. LeVar, as a, you're a former linebacker. Let me push back on the position of linebacker. Push back if on. you look at the most important positions on defense right now, it's edge rusher and cornerback. You've got to get to the quarterback and you've got to defend on the outside where receivers dominate this league. So why are the Cowboys loading up at linebacker? OK, you mentioned Van Der Esch. We got Jalen Smith. They bring on Keanu Neal from Atlanta and they say before the draft, we're going to make him like a linebacker hybrid. And then they draft Micah Parsons. Why are you stacked at linebacker, deficient passing, rushing the passer and deficient in the secondary? To me, Dan Quinn's got a lot of pieces, but they don't all go together right. Would you agree or disagree? I, I disagree. I, I think, and you just mentioned Trayvon, uh, Stefan's little brother. Trayvon uh, that, listen, I think they do have guys in the secondary. I wouldn't say and go out as far as to say corner is the most important position. The, the linebacker in the, in the safety is the most important position to a defense because they're the ones that are going to make sure everybody's where they need to be. Now, you do need to have coverage. You do need to have guys that understand how to cover. But ultimately, if the scheme is set up the right way, your corners don't you don't have to like this whole statement of shut down corners. You don't have to have a shut down corner. That's why they're so special when you see them. There's only been a handful of guys you can say that is a shut down corner. There's not very many. So in more more cases, more often than not, a really, really smart cornerback understands where his coverage is, what his leverage points are, how far away from the, the sideline are they, where's their next closest guy, is it a linebacker, is it my safety, what are the windows of opportunity and the coverage that I'm in, is it a zone, is it a man, how much time do I have when I'm in man, there are so many different things like detail-wise that you have to pay attention to as a cornerback in the game, guys like a middle backer, or a safety that understands the dimensions of the field, they can let those cornerbacks know what's good and what's dangerous. They can let them know where to take chances, when to not take chances. You got to have somebody who's keeping everybody on that line, on that string, to make sure you're getting the type of results that you're looking for and you're seeking. But yes, you do want to be able to get to the, to the quarterback. You can get to the quarterback from a different way than just sending defensive ends to get there. They are super important. They get compensated that way. But when you're looking at the breakdown schematically of how a defense works, that's why Micah Parsons is important. He can pass rush like a, a Mac, a Khalil Mack. He can pass rush like a Von Miller. But he can also play backer on the inside like a regular true inside backer. So you're going to see him move around. They called it when I played. I did the same type of things. They called it the X backer position. They move you around. If he gets to a point where they're creative with it. He can actually choose which gaps he wants to go into and let the defense alignment know by call and by scheme, all right, left, left. I'm going left. You go right. I'm coming in your gap. I, if I call your name, this is where I'm coming. This is where I'm going. So schematically speaking, this, this sets up to be a really, really fun opportunity for Dan Quinn to maximize the talent that he has on his, his defensive unit. All right, back to the NBA. Andre Drummond ditched the Lakers ink a deal with the Sixers. We held back up Joel Embiid. The two Giants have a bit of a history dating back to 2017 when Embiid criticized Drummond for his defense. Later that year, oh boy, Drummond brushed off Embiid by questioning his durability. Their feud spilled over into 2018 when Embiid tweeted he owned real estate in Drummond's head. Drummond fired back by throwing shade at Embiid's conditioning. Chris, how will this play out in Philadelphia? Well, first, let me address the basketball issue of it. It's a good pickup. Obviously, he's going to play the Dwight Howard role. Obviously, Joel Embiid has to be low managed. So when, when Embiid's out, they got a guy that can go in there and get you 15 and 12 on a nightly basis in Andre Drummond. So for a backup center, 
for the veteran minimum, this is a good pickup, all right, basketball-wise. As far as their attitudes, it's not going to be an issue. I, I, there's no way I think this is an issue. First of all, I would imagine they ran this by Joel Embiid. Secondly, when you look at the NBA, when you go at a guy and you trash talk a guy due to the media or even on social media, that means you you think he's worthy of your time. All right, you're not going to go at somebody. You might go at them in a game if you think they really can't play. But all the other stuff, you don't have to be bothered with somebody who's way beneath your level. So MB knows Drum is pretty good. He's not as good as me, but he's a pretty good player. All right, and, and we've seen this before. Aren't Kevin Durant and Draymond Green playing together on Team USA? We know about their history. Didn't Kobe Bryant and Meta World Peace have some issues? Remember in the playoffs when World Peace was in Houston? They almost came to blows. They were nose to nose. And the next season, Meta World Peace is playing small forward in the starting five for the Lakers who go ahead and win the title with Kobe Bryant. Kobe had issues with Matt Barnes. Matt Barnes faking the ball in his face. Remember that? The next season, Kobe calls Barnes. Hey, man, anybody that's crazy enough to go at me is crazy enough to play with me. So they, there's a respect level there. Even amidst all the trash talk, they'll be fine. I don't think it'll be an issue at all. You know, even Jesus went and got a rider and saw Got so deep, he na- changed his name to Paul. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, listen, it can, it can work go. out. I, I think when you, when, you, when you go into goon mode, right, and that's what this is, when goons are goons, you respect that. I, I love having you as a teammate. I hate having you as an opponent. I can recall <laughs> Warren Sapp used to skip through stretching lines when I was playing. And, and I, I remember saying during the week, if Warren Sapp comes through our stretching line, I'm going to go at him. I don't care if I lose. I don't care what happens. You're not going to skip through and disrespect our stretching line. So it became this whole big thing. Warren said what he said. Said he was going, you know, I've dealt with people much bigger than him. Became a thing. If Warren Sapp, if me and Warren Sapp ever played on the same team, I would be the happiest dude in the world having that guy on our defensive front. There would not be us in the locker room talking about, hey, bruh, I remember when you hit me up on Twitter and was like, I got real estate in your head, player. Like, it ain't, it's not going to go down that way. Guys respect one another when you don't. Like, if, if a dude would have been like, I'm in your head, player, and he's like, oh, no, he's in my head. Like, I don't want him. Like, we ain't good. Like, I'm not good with this dude. He's, he's a fake tough guy. He's, he's soft. But this is two dudes that, that are alpha males. They're, they're, they're apex guys. When you come together on, on the same team, Embiid needs to have a little bit more. They didn't have, in my opinion, enough toughness in this year's playoffs. When it came down to it and you needed an enforcer like an Anthony Mason type dude or Charles Oakley, somebody that might set a tone, because Embiid, Embiid is tough, but Embiid is finesse. You know, when you talk about Drummond, Drummond is just, that's a powerful dude. So you bring that into your, your, your building. Now the question becomes, what do we do with Ben Simmons? Because now we do have that extra added piece down low where we don't have to depend on Embiid going down into the trenches. So what do we do in terms of what is our outside, our perimeter game going to look like? I think he's a better addition and a better fit for this, this uh, 76ers team than even Dwight Howard was coming into the situation this past year. Wow. I'm stunned that you guys are this high on Andre Drummond. I want to turn back the clock to game six, Lakers' Suns in the playoffs. Do you Where guys remember what Drummond did? Do you remember what he, he was, did? He was watching. Did not play coach's decision, okay? Andre Drummond has had a nice career. Daryl Morey loves to shop in the bargain basement bin. Sure, I will take a former all-star at the veterans' minimum. I mean, that's, that's where Andre Drummond was. Nobody wants this guy. I mean, a good player, former all-star, 15 and 12, like you said. But the reality is, this is misdirection, Chris. Chris, this is taking everybody's shine away from the real story in Philadelphia. What the hell is going on with Ben Simmons? Because that's all that anybody cares about. The draft comes and goes. No trade for Ben Simmons. Free agency, we're what, three days in? Crickets on the Ben Simmons front. Chris, LeVar, both of you know you cannot play Ben Simmons and Andre Drummond on the court at the same time. 
two non-shooters. Drummond's barely even a rim roller at this point. Like, I don't know what's going on in Philadelphia, and the Ben Simmons stuff is extremely troubling. The question was, uh, how will this play out? Frankly, Embiid and Drummond will dap each other up, have fun in practice, go at it. Doesn't really matter. What matters is what's going to happen with Ben Simmons. And Daryl Morey's facing it right now because we're all watching in Portland when Damian Lillard basically put down an edict. I need you guys to give me stars. I, I saw Giannis got Drew Holiday, and y'all need to get me somebody. Have you seen what Portland's done, Chris? They didn't get nobody. Damian Lillard is very upset. And right now, if uh, Daryl Morey can pull off Damian Lillard for Ben Simmons in some capacity, I know Portland doesn't want to do it, but maybe they should. That's when the Sixers will matter. But right now, they're not top four in the East. And frankly, I'm no lie here, no cap, as the kids say. No cap. Keep an eye on the Chicago Bulls making a run to bypass the always injured Joel Embiid and the 76ers, who seem to be cratering after being the number one seed last year. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to the Bulls a little bit later. Um, but obviously, I see where you're coming from. But look, I, I, I'm with you, J Mac, on let's not overstate. Andre Drummond, all right? It's a nice pickup for the vet minimum. You got a center that's injury prone. He does bring a certain attitude, what you said, LeVar. I think he'll be fine in a backup role. You can also play them together at times, potentially, because Drummond can play down low. And Embiid, as you said, he, he's, he is a great mid-range shooter. Not a good one, a great mid-range shooter. And so he can be on the perimeter but, yeah, j Mac, let's see what they do with Ben Simmons. They've got to make this move because of the, I'm not as high on Chicago as you are, but other teams in the East are making moves. Miami, I do think, at this point has surpassed Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to see what they do with Ben Simmons. They're trying, and there are people around the league who will tell you they're going to move him. What they need is Damian Lillard to go ahead to – uh, Portland and say, go, send me to Philly. <laughs> because Dame put out, when Damian Lillard said, I want to see what they do, what could they do? I'm not surprised they didn't do anything. They couldn't do anything. There was no major move out there for the Portland Trail Blazers to make. So I, I think Dame knew that. So you were basically saying, you got to go do something that you're incapable of doing if you want to keep me. So he obviously doesn't want to be the bad guy. I think he may give him a year. But if Dame Lillard or Bradley Beal needs to say to their management, send me to Philadelphia or Golden State, but send me to a contender, and I think the best spot is Philly because you can play with Joel Embiid. Wait, LaVar, did I just hear Chris Wright? Did he just say that uh, what can Portland do? Bro, the Lakers – just flipped Kuzma, KCP, and a bunch of spare parts for an awesome team that is the favorite now in the nobody West. Nobody else Russell wanted Westbrook Russell Westbrook, and four Westbrook, guys who can shoot over you 40% You nobody wanted people Westbrook people with that contract. Stop it. People aren't going Listen, to Portland. Listen, that's another thing Russell that people... Oh, hold on, real quick. People underestimate this about LeBron. Le you make a good point. Everybody wants to come to L.A. Yeah, we got the high taxes out here, but we also have the beaches in Hollywood. I'm just going to put this out there. LeBron is an unbelievable recruiter. And recruiter. you guys blasted me for me ripping Kawhi. Hey, I haven't heard Kawhi make any moves. I haven't heard Damian Lillard recruit anybody. For all the talk about Draymond Green working on guys on the, uh, on the t U.S. Olympic team, I, Golden State didn't get nobody. Um, so we need to give LeBron a little bit more props for him recruiting Carmelo and Kendrick Nunn and uh, Ellington and all these guys. Malik Monk, they got a good roster, Chris. The Lakers have a good roster because of LeBron. Where's Joel Embiid on the recruiting front, huh? What's he doing out there? These star players, Chris, have to step up. Le LeBron's a great recruiter, but recruiting isn't necessarily part of the game. He wants to do it. That's fine. Go out and do it. But, you know, if you don't want to do it, don't do it if you're a player. I I'm not going to rip these guys because they don't go out there and recruit guys to play with them. You know, but if LeBron, LeBron is great at doing it, he does a good job. But I'm not going to rip some of these guys if that's not what they're about. Go play with what you got. No mercy. Our last taste of NFL action came when we saw Brady and Tampa pick apart Mahomes and the Chiefs in Super Bowl 55. The latest power rankings by Pro Football Focus don't reflect what took place in that game. Instead, the Chiefs are at the top, followed by the Bucks, Bills, Ravens, and Packers. LeVar Arrington, do you have any issues with this list? I do have a few issues with it. I mean, I, I, largely in part, I think they 
did an excellent job of, of compiling the teams. But I, I don't believe that the Ravens should be as high. I don't believe that the Packers should be as low. The Ravens haven't shown us that they can take that next step um, closer to getting to that Super Bowl um, with Lamar Jackson, that quarterback. Not, not throwing shade, just, just facts. So I, I think them being at right. four is a little bit, uh, uh, that's high. I look at the Bills, and I still see more potential than I've seen more solidification. Three might be too high for the Bills. Why have the Packers at five when the Packers have shown repeatedly that they can make it to the game before the Super Bowl and their roster is pretty much the same? If anything, they're probably going to be a tad bit better than what they were uh, in years past. If you want to throw out the drama of this offseason and and try to paint the picture that they can't win um, with Aaron Rodgers being in a dramatic situation, well, just take last year and use that as a reference point. Right. It didn't seem to hold him back from accomplishing at a high level. He happened to get, um, oh, yeah, he was the league MVP last year, and they were one game away from the Super Bowl. So being at five, that's a little bit challenging to me. I would like for the Rams to be a little bit higher on this list. They're at six. Not in, They don't round off the top five. They're at six. And I know everybody's talking about the question marks at center position and the running backs position. You know, you lose two running backs, one to injury, and one isn't with the, with the team anymore. But again, I believe adding, uh, what's, what's my guys, what's my quarterback, Matt, uh, Stafford. Matt Stafford to the, to the roster. Stafford. Uh, I believe adding him to the roster and knowing that you have some veteran core guys on that offensive line they are going to be able to make pre-snap reads that are going to offset not having that bell cow back. They'll be able to get through that. And, and the last one, I think people are counting out the Saints because of not having Drew Brees and, and really putting, putting a nail in the coffin on what the run has been for the New Orleans Saints. I think they still deserve a, a higher level of respect than where they are on on this list. Saints are at seven. They're okay. at seven. I, I just I think that that they should be a little bit higher than seven, oh okay. maybe even top five in, in my estimation. Oh my gosh! All right, Chris, I'll let you go. I really want to jump in on the Saints, but Chris, go go please go next. Well, well, first let me start here, and, and I said yesterday I'm leaning toward picking Kansas City over Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl. That said, I think Tampa Bay should be number one on this list. They are the defending champions. They did beat Kansas City handily in the Super Bowl. They do have all 22 starters back. We talked about yesterday they add Gio Bernard as a pass catcher out of the backfield, which was one of the few things they lacked. O.J. Howard is coming back from injury to shore up an already strong tight end position. So there's, I, I don't know why you don't put Tampa Bay at number one. Obviously, Kansas City will be number two. Then I'm with you, LeVar. I, I like Buffalo. I would put Green Bay number three. Uh, There's a lot of disrespect going around for Green Bay. And there are people, and I'm, look, everybody's overestimating the damage, what's going to happen in this offseason. Aaron Rodgers is probably in a better state of mind this season than he was last year when he was the MVP. He was upset with something to prove when he was last season because they drafted Jordan Love, so I think he's in a better space mentally now. Devontae Adams, we know he wants the big contract. If he doesn't get it, he's going to go out there and prove he deserves it. So I expect big things from him. Look, 13-3 and three the last two years, uh, when they posted that photo, even if this is the last dance for Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams in Green Bay, they know very well that what Jordan Pippen and Pippen did in their last season in Chicago was go win the chip. All right, so you don't put that picture up there without knowing we better be ready to deliver. So I think Green Bay is going to be much better. You know, as good as they've been, I'm not picking them over Tampa, but I don't agree with the disrespect that they're getting. I do agree with you too, LeVar. I think the, the Ravens are way too high. I would not have them in the top five. Remember a year ago, they were six and five midway through the season or little past midway through the season. Then they ran off five straight wins, four of them against bad teams, Cincinnati, Jacksonville, you know, losing teams. The only good team they beat in that stretch was Cleveland. So I, Lamar was good, 
but he wasn't great like he was the year before. Is he going to take the step in the passing game to take them to a new level and balance out that offense? So that remains to be seen. I would put Seattle, Cleveland, and the Rams ahead of the Ravens. Mm. So I, I, that was my main beef with the Ravens, I think, are too high on this list. Okay, all right. Uh, let me bring some sanity to this discussion. I got my pen. I'm going to puncture some stuff you guys said. First of all, uh, yes, the Packers have been good. Just two quick notes. They lost their center. He's now with the Chargers. If you start reading the camps about the camp reports out of Green Bay, they're going to start a rookie at center. Their right tackle is gone, and their left tackle, Bakhtiari, had surgery probably out for the first month. So that's three new offensive linemen for 37-year-old Aaron Rodgers. And also, they play a league-high 10 games against teams that made the playoffs last year. They have a brutal schedule, probably toughest in the league. I'm not as high on the Packers as you gentlemen. Wow. However, my big issue, you guys know I do a lot of gambling stuff uh, for Fox Sports, is with the New Orleans Saints, okay? Don't tell me what you think. Tell me what's in your portfolio. I have bet the Saints under significantly, okay? They have no wide receivers for the first month. Michael Thomas is out, okay? They lost, I believe, five starters on the defense. And I don't trust Jameis Winston at all. I wouldn't trust him to pick up my mail if I was on vacation. Wow. I don't trust him to quarterback the New Orleans Saints. I'm sorry. Taysom Hill, that's your other option? Like, Sean Payton's going to be up against it in, in a division that's pretty weak, but you got to face the Bucs <coughs> twice. I think the Saints are way, way overrated. And by the way, if you want to look to Vegas... You know, the Saints on this list are seventh. Vegas has, uh, I believe, the Saints at 17th or 13th, somewhere in that range. Finally, again, what's in your portfolio? I am irrationally confident about the Jacksonville Jaguars this year. Uh, I've, I've, heavy research on the Jags. Urban Meyer, and, and I know people, are, LeVar, you know this well. These college coaches come to the league and they flame out. But what do they do in that first year? They have success. Chip Kelly, playoffs in his first year. There is a list of uh, coaches in their first year because they're new to the league. People don't really know what they're going to do. Urban Meyer is going to have success. And, oh, yeah, Trevor Lawrence is kind of good. Andrew Luck turned a 2-14 and Colts team into an 11-5 and team in one year. I don't know that the Jags win 11 games, but Trevor Lawrence is set up for success in a pretty weak division. We've talked about the Colts injuries this week. Texans probably the worst team in the league. So the Jags at 29 is criminally low. I bet on them to win the division. I bet their win total over. Just keep an eye on the Jags. And I just want to, I know we have a lot of Saints fans who watch this show, Skip, you know, very friendly with the Saints. They're going to be bad this year, folks. It's a six or seven win team. No, I'd push back on that. I, I know there's a lot of question marks, but you can't underestimate the value of culture and a system and a competent head coach. I, I push back on New Orleans Saints. I think they're actually being under you know, undervalued right now, but that's that. That's fine. I do think that the Colts should not be as high as they are on this list. Uh, they definitely should be lower, especially now knowing that they don't have uh, Carson Wentz, which I don't even know how much that was going to make a difference. I think that I think this Colts team is a really good team, but I do think that there are the biggest question mark is at the quarterback's position. So uh, I wouldn't have the Colts that. And, and again, the Rams. There should be more conversation surrounding this Rams Rams team. I, I really I really think that it's it's understated or overstated, I should say, as to the problems that are are plaguing the Rams right now and how that may hold them back from being uh, a team that takes the next step. I think that they should clearly be looked at as the favorite in the NFC West as of today. I do think that they have more of a, a setup to to be successful in the playoffs more so than than some of these other teams that they have ahead of them that are on the NFC side of, of the coin. So to me, the Rams should be being talked about a little bit more, even though there are question marks that continue to be the reason why the Rams aren't looked at in a more glowing fashion. Real quick, LeVar, the Saints are seven. J-Mac. Hold on, hold on. The Cowboys are 17. Tell me you don't agree with that. Uh... I think that the, the, the Dallas Cowboys have things to prove. I've said that already. You can't call, you know, you can't call this team a Super Bowl contending team until they show they're a Super Bowl contending team. I think they have personnel that allows for them to be, you know, rated and it be justifiable. But until they show that they can win big games, you can't put them in the conversation of the upper echelons teams until we see what they're going to do. 
I got bones to pick with both of you Uh-oh. guys. Uh, okay. Let me start with LeVar. Okay. You just sat here a few segments ago <laughs> and all but called the Dallas Cowboys defense the steel curtain no, or the no, Legion no, of Boom. I mean, that, now <laughs> you're content to, they have to with show them it. being 17th? They have That's to show ridiculous. It. 17th? No, they. I'm not saying they're getting to the Super Bowl, but they need to be higher than 17. And then you, J-Mac, how dare you chastise us? And then sit here and sing the praises of the Jacksonville Jaguars? That is very true. Are you kidding that me? That is very true. That he just do totally that. ruined your whole argument. Okay. You should have left he that part out. too many out. situations right? with, and, and with look, Urban. Yes. Too many, too on, many man. avocado room conversations with, with Urban. <laughs> and I'm not as high on New Orleans as LeVar is. But I think you are criminally underestimating them, J-Mac. I'm going to ride with Jameis Winston. I, Jameis Winston, there's no doubt he has talent. I think a year learning at the feet of Drew Brees, I think learning at the feet of Sean Payton, Payton's going to play to his strengths. I, all he needed to do was learn how not to make the bad decisions <laughs> he was making for all those interceptions. The dude threw for 30 touchdowns. He threw for 5,000-plus yards. Yeah, so I, I think, I, I'm not saying he's going to be all pro, but he's going to have a nice season. Nice. You are underestimating okay. famous so James. Jameis was pretty awful with Mike Evans and Chris Godwin as awful. his receiver. He just turned the ball he, over. He, he, he led the league awful. in interceptions. Right. Is that not awful? The ball over. That, it's awful that he led the league in interceptions, but you can't say throwing for the most yards out of well, any quarterback trailing. in the league is awful. They're trailing in every and game. He throws a million TVs. pick sixes. He's a disaster, okay? And now, can you name the starting receivers for the Saints with Michael Thomas out? Like, I dare you. Like, that's a Jeopardy question right now. Who's starting at receiver for the Saints? It's like Obviously, they're going to miss Michael like, Thomas. Yeah, major. That first month is going to be brutal. I'm telling you, this Saints team is in for some real rude awakenings. I like Sean Payton, you as you said. play the games. But uh, this yeah, team but is Jacksonville's stuff, getting to the conference championship. No, I don't know about that, but they're winning the division. <laughs> no mercy. I got me. DeMar DeRozan is Chicago-bound as he struck a three-year, $85 million deal to join an upstart Bulls team as part of a sign-and-trade with the Spurs. The all-star swingman will join Lonzo Ball, Zach Levine, Nikola Vucevic, Vucevic, and Alex Caruso as they look to rise to relevancy in the East. Chris, have the Chicago Bulls done enough to make themselves a threat to the Bucks or Nets? Heavens no. Oh, heavens no. Please tell me this is a trick question. Please tell me this is a trick question. J-Mac, you had to come up with this question. After you sang the praises of the Bulls yesterday. I will. I mean, a threat to the Nets or the Bucks? Come on. No. A thousand times no. Look, I like what the Bulls have done this offseason. I like Lonzo Ball next to Zach Levine. I, with, with those two being able to shoot threes, even Nick Vucevic can shoot threes, you can have a DeMar DeRozan at your small forward who's a mid-range assassin who gets to the rim. So that's a nice thing. Then you got, they probably got Patrick Williams at the power forward. That's a nice little lineup. But they, let's see if they make the playoffs. All right, because right now I'm looking at, obviously, Brooklyn, Milwaukee. Then we got Miami. Miami. Then we got Philadelphia. Then we've got Atlanta and Boston. That's six. New York. The Knicks just added Kimball Walker. They got Evan Fournier. They brought back Derrick Rose. They, 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 or they, they got uh, Julius Randle, obviously, Mitchell Robinson, and a coach who gets the most out of his teams in the regular season in Tom Thibodeau. And then I got Indiana with a great coach. And Rick Carlisle, a team that had made the playoffs five straight years, I believe, before they fell off last year because of the coaching. It was just a bad situation. They got Malcolm Brogdon, DeMontis Sabonis, Miles Turner, Karis LeVert. Like, the Pacers are better than the Bulls. So I'm looking at, I think the Bulls will battle with Charlotte and Washington for the play-in. Oh. I expect a little improvement, but my, are we really – Battling with the Nets and the Bucks, come on, come on! They'll do well to make the playoffs. They got a shot. They'll do well to make the playoffs. I tend to agree. I, I agree with where you're coming from. I do think they have improved their team, 
But to say that they've improved their team to be the favorite out of the East, I think that's a, a bit of a reach. But listen, you add DeRozan, I think that that's a, a bit of a coup. You know, I thought that there were some some more uh, better landing spots or or more feasible uh, places that DeRozan could have ended up. I, I was thinking if it wasn't the Lakers, once I knew it wasn't the Lakers, it might have been the Clips. So there, there were some, some situations that could have played out very differently than him ending up in, in the Windy City. Lonzo Ball being there now. I, I think that they do have a nice youth movement um, that they've created. It, it could be a very, very um, fun team to watch, an exciting team to watch. Right. But once you start getting into talking about um, battling with, with, with the juggernauts of, of the, that side of the conference, I just don't see them stacking up uh, with this roster just yet with, with the guys um, at the top. We don't speak a lot about Atlanta, but Atlanta, uh, in my opinion, uh, they're right there at it to be a more consistent uh, appearance, uh, a team that appears uh, closer to making it to, to finals, finals appearances. Uh, then you look at what took place with the Milwaukee Bucks. The Milwaukee Bucks may be more um, valued than what they truly are in my, my estimation. I thought that this was just a really good opportunity this season for them to take advantage of how things played out in terms of guys who were healthy versus not healthy. Giannis was able to get healthy quick enough to be a part of the run to get that championship. But I don't know that I look at them as being, you know, a heavy favorite coming into this year. I mean, losing P.J. Tucker, I think that some guys, whether it shows up on the, the, the stat line or not, are vital pieces to what a team's identity and personality is. I thought that P.J. Tucker brought that uh, to this team. It was great that they were able to get uh, uh, Portis back onto the team and sign him. So I thought that was a big, a big sign for them. But I'm not high, super high on the Bucks. I'm not super high on the Sixers. So when I look at what's going on in the East, a lot of it, Atlanta. I think that the Knicks will improve, obviously, but I'm not sure if that is something that I should should buy into, that they're going to consistently be good. I think that Brooklyn has to show that they can be healthy and that they can go through the season and it not be a, a drama, uh, days of our lives playing out in front of us every time we talk about them. Can they transition from that? I do think Brooklyn is the team to beat in the East, but I do think that the East is wide open, but there should be more conversations surrounding the Atlanta Hawks. I like what the Miami Heat did, but like the, Hawks the Hawks have proven, wow. well, the Hawks have proven that they should be in these types of discussions moving forward. Yeah, by the way, the Hawks just added John Collins five for a million, one point, uh, sorry, 125 mil. Not a bad ad addition, but y'all need to put some Keeping respect. On the name of Zach Levine. Mm. He is the best dunker in the NBA right he now. He can sing, too. He averaged 27 <laughs> points a game. Yeah, that, that helps man, Zach wins Levine being the best dunker. Is such a that bucket helps. getter in the league right now. He is outstanding. <laughs> and by the way, I'll just keep it real with you guys because I always do. The Bulls are in the playoffs this past year if Levine doesn't get COVID and the Bulls, they, they cratered right after that at the end of the season, okay? No, Chicago is not on the level of Brooklyn or Miami. They're not quite on the level of the Bucks, who are a cup below those two, as I explained yesterday. And then there's a log jam, Chris. I I'm sorry. Like, the 76ers are taking a step back because we know Ben Simmons is going to get shipped. We don't know where or for what. We don't think it's going to be Dame. That's why they fall back to the pack. I'm with you, LeVar. I like Atlanta. Uh, I don't know about the Knicks. Some of these numbers were a little fugazi, these defensive three-point shooting numbers. Like, it doesn't seem like it's going to be able to duplicate uh, what they did last year. And I just, just keep an eye on this Bulls team. They added good defense, right? Billy Donovan likes defense. He adds Lonzo, strong defender, does a lot of things. And Alex Caruso, the really talented uh, Lakers shooting guard. Like, those are two good defenders. And now, I think DeMar DeRozan anchors your second unit. I don't even know if you start him. I think you build a second unit around him. I, I really like this team, guys. I think this is a 45-win team. I think they're probably fifth or sixth when it all shakes out. I really like what Donovan's doing. And oh, final note, word, the Bulls have been bad for quite some time. The league is better when the tentpole franchises, the Chicago, the big market Knicks, and L.A. is strong. And I think that's where we're headed next year. I think New York will have two playoff teams. 
I think Chicago will have one, and L.A. will have one, the Lakers. I don't think the Clippers get to the playoffs. First of all, the league is fine. It's, it's nice to have oh, the really? Knicks be good. League's Congratulations. Fine? That's great. It's okay. nice to have the Bulls be good. But the, the Knicks haven't been good for how long? I, it, consistently good. They haven't been consistently good this century. And the league has been fine. <laughs> all right, so, so stop it with all that stuff. I mean, that, that's just keeping it real. And then, J-Mac, you don't pay a dude three years, $85 million to have him shore up your second unit. Well... They, they got to let DeMar play. And De- DeMar made this move for the money. All right, th- that's all there is to yeah. it. I, I, look, and I'm not mad at him. Go get your money, DeMar. You're going to be a young Stay man when you retire and these multi-millions of dollars stop coming in. So I'm not mad at him, but that's why he went to the Bulls because there were a few teams out there with that type of money that were throwing it at him. So he went to a rebuilding situation in Chicago. Yeah, I would have loved to see him with the Clippers. You know, Lakers would have been fine, but the Clippers, I thought that was a place where his role would be to go out and get us 20-something points on a team that was going to be a playoff team with him. So I I think that would have been a good fit. But look, I I like what the Bulls have done. I think they're taking a step in the right direction. You know, but to think that they're now up there a notch below the leaders, as you said, J. Mac, no, I, I can't put them up that far. Yeah, well, you're just not putting respect on Zach Levine's name. I don't see people. He came into the league. He hadn't done a he's ton. He's fine, but he's, he's one not player. fine. He's elevated himself to all NBA caliber. That's what we're talking about with him. And I, I always pronounce his name wrong, so I have to write it down. Vucicic, uh, the center. He's a nice player. Thank Vucevic. you, Lamar, for laughing at me. Yeah. He, he's a really nice player. I'm just telling you guys, they've got the pieces. They, it's going to probably take a, a month or so to work together. You know, everybody's wearing name tags in the huddle because they don't know who's who. But this team has talent. And I'll just, if you put the Knicks roster next to the Bulls, Bulls have more talents, Chris. I'm sorry. That's just a matter of fact right now. I like Kemba Walker. Knicks have a better coach. They do. Uh, Thibodeau, Knicks slight have a edge over coach. Donovan. Yeah, yeah. LeVar, final word. I just, I just like Zach when he sings with Maroon 5. I really am a big fan of his songs and <laughs> all of the things that he's done and the music industry. We appreciate you, Zach. Thank yes. you. Thank you. No mercy. The Cowboys boast the second best receiving corps in all of football, according to Pro Football Focus. And who can blame them? Dallas has an established pro bowler in Amari Cooper, a reliable playmaker in Michael Gallup, and an up-and-coming star in C.D. Lamb. They'll look to take the NFL by storm with Dak Prescott back under center. LeVar, do you expect the Cowboys to have an elite offense in 2021? An elite offense in 2021. (laughs) Yes, I do. Be careful. I I do believe that they will have an elite offense. And and for the simple fact that, look, right now you you have uh, you have a very, very strong, a very strong personnel grouping. Tyron Smith right now is listed as out going into this Hall of Fame game. I don't place too much on it um, for now. I will say, you know, looking at Amari Cooper, he's dealing with a little bit of a, a foot injury issue or foot issue or whatever, some, some type of a injury he's nursing. It is ultimately going to come down to the health and the mindset of this unit. Dak Prescott coming off of a, a brutal injury last season. How is his mindset going to be approaching this new season? What is his level of expectation? I think it's high. And I think that he's willing and I think he's able to be a better quarterback than what he's been even in the past. I agree. A lot of people will say he's a garbage time stats getter quarterback. But there are a lot of things that we have seen that are really, really impressive about Dak Prescott. And and with all the criticisms that have been lobbed his way, I do believe that with the, the maturity of Ezekiel Elliott, seemingly the maturity that he's showing um, in this approach to this year's uh, training camp is an exciting thing for this team because to have a running back, which is an obsolete position at this point in time, to have a guy, an elite guy at that position come in focused and ready to go with the right mindset is a big deal. 
to have a receiving core where C.D. Lamb is now going into his second season. There's going to be a level of confidence and maturity there where he's going to achieve at a higher level. Gallup has been, he's been like the Alvin Harper of, of this oh, receiving group. He's nice. not the Michael Irving, but he's going to give you some really big plays. I look for C.D. Lamb to possibly emerge into being the guy for this receiving court this season. If you get Tony Pollard uh, contributing the way he does, Blake Jarwin at that tight end's position, a 6'5", 260-pound tight end who can run and can catch, there are a lot of weapons out there for Dak Prescott. So it now ultimately comes down to where is your offensive line going to draw the line in the sand? Are they going to be some bad boys that handle thing in a retro type of way like they did when they were good with Emmitt and the big three and Troy Aikman and, and Novacek and Irving? Or are they going to be this new age style of guys that's more finesse and we'll see what happens and take risk and, and hope that Dak can stay healthy? Open up holes for Zeke and Tony to run through. Keep, keep Dak upright and safe and being able to deliver balls. This should be an elite offense. I have a question for you, LeVar. Why did you chasten me yesterday for saying that the Cowboys were going to win the division and this, they should be thinking about winning the division and winning a game in the playoffs? Because today... You have come on here and said they're going to have an elite offense yes. and their defense is going to be the 85 Bears. I can so, predict. So what was nah, wrong with my prediction? That's so funny. All right, so here. I mean, you, you, on a J-Mac, was he not praising I, that defense? Sard has a decent point. He hasn't made many today, but he's got a good one here, LeVar. All right, allow me to explain. <laughs> allow me to reintroduce myself. Uh, so the thing about <laughs> what, what you were saying yesterday. Reintroduce your points. I do believe that they have to prove that they can be all of these things. I can say that they're going to have the best rookie defensive player on their side of the ball. I can say that they're going to have one of the best defenses if these things come together. It looks good on paper. It looks good in theory, and it sounds good what, we're hearing, what I'm hearing. On the offensive side of the ball, I can look at it and say this is what I'm thinking could take place. The problem I've had with, with the Dallas Cowboys in terms of making bold predictions with them is they never really live up to them in, <laughs> in recent history. So as good as it sounds for me to say what I think and believe they can be, it ultimately comes down to when I go down to if you're holding my feet to the fire and you're saying make a bold prediction, they have to prove it to me before I start making bold predictions in terms of what their accomplishments are going to be. They can have an elite offense and not be the division champions, honestly. They can get a ton of stats but not be an elite team. Those things can happen. You can have a good defense. I know firsthand you can have a good defense but have a failing team. So there are a lot of elements that can play out in favor of the Cowboys without them having a successful season. I have to wait and see on results, right. on the results of where they end up winning a Super Bowl or getting to the Super Bowl or winning divisional round games in the playoffs. We got to get there first. I'm, I, they haven't done enough for me to, to sign off on that yet, Chris. All right. Well, here, look, here we go. I'll answer the question. Do I think they're going to be an elite offense? I'm going to say pretty good to very good. But Somewhere in there. Because elite, when I think of when I think of elite offense, I'm thinking of Tampa Bay, Kansas City, and Green Bay. And I don't think they'll be as good as any of those teams. But I do think they can be a, a good offense. I, I really am a Dak fan. I have gone to the wall fighting for Dak. I love his intangibles. I think he's a winner. I think he's tough physically and mentally. He obviously can make things happen with his legs. He's become a very good passer over the last few seasons. But I, you're talking about prove it to me, uh, LeVar. Look, people that are thinking, I hope they don't think he's going to be anywhere near the 371 yards he averaged last year. I don't know. That's, that's crazy, right? But is he going to be 330? Is he going to be up there in the top four or five passers in the league? I'm not ready to go there because the truth is those numbers were inflated because of the Cowboys being behind in games. Let me look at a few of them. He only played five games, right? Game number two, he throws for 502 yards against Cleveland. 
They were down 41 to 14 before he got rocking and rolling with all those yards. <laughs> Seattle, they're down 30 to 15 in the third quarter. He throws for 472. A lot of it playing but he catch him up. Back. He brought Atlanta, him back in that he game, throws, though. He, he brought him back. I get it because Atlanta is my next one. 450 yards. Yeesh. They're down 20 to nothing. 29 to 10. He brought him back. You know this, Levar. A lot of that. Well, some of that was going prevent, right? Some of that's natural human nature. We got this game won, and he was able to come back. Yes, it takes a. It does speak to something that you were able to rally your team even though they still lost most of those games. <laughs> but the teams, he like he didn't do damage against the Rams. They scored 17 points. He threw for less than he threw like 260 yards. All right, so I do want to see him do this stuff in the first half against the better teams. They got a favorable schedule, so that helps. But do some of this stuff in the first and second quarters and don't get behind and then play catch-up. That's what I want to see Dak do. So I can't believe this. You guys both said a lot of smart stuff. You went for about seven minutes saying really intelligent, next-level oh, stuff. Here we go. And neither of you mentioned the number one impact to this elite offense, the offensive line. They can't do anything if this offensive line is as banged up as it was last year I or the year the before. Line. I mean, uh, Lyle Collins, okay, great tackle. It. Tyron Smith, great tackle. They played two games last year, guys. This li offensive line can't protect Dak. They can't do anything. Dak's not going to have time. You know that he gave up 24 sacks last year on blown blocks. An incredible stat. Led the league. If they can't protect the quarterback, I don't care who you're throwing to. I don't care about Tony Pollard and the other guy, Ezekiel Elliott. I don't care about Blake Jarwin. None of this matters if the, the offensive line guy. isn't healthy. And LeVar opened by saying, oh, Tyron Smith, probably not going to play in the uh, preseason opener. Oh, okay. Got it. Well, how's Zach Martin? Like, if the offensive line isn't there, none of this matters. None of it. I mean, you're probably going to have Washington steal the division because guess what? Their defense is incredible, and they are going to annihilate the Cowboys' offensive line if it isn't healthy. So we can get excited about Michael Gallup and CeeDee Lamb in the slot, and yeah, they're going to come back from being down 30 to 5, or 30 to 5 is not as well, 30 to 6. But if the offensive line is not healthy, just forget about the Cowboys. Forget about the 11 wins. Forget about the division. And talk to me when we know the status of the offensive line. Here's what I say. I'm going to take you guys into football 101 very quickly and, and break down why they can be an elite offense this year. Coach McCarthy has an ability, this, this amazing ability to be able to dial up plays that take advantage of what a defense is ultimately trying to do. Having the familiarity with his personnel now and them having familiarity with them, they are now going to be able to look at defenses and see what they're trying to do. If you find balance, and yes, you're right, it does, it does all resonate from if your offensive line is ready to go because in, in establishing balance, you're going to look at what the personnel and what the personality of the defense that you're going up against is trying to do. Some, some defenses love stacking the box with four men down. Some like using three and stacking it up with linebackers. Some even like bringing down a, a safety that can be uh, the linebacker, an extra added body to stop the run. Their personality is to stop the run. So you'll see nine, ten men, eight man boxes that are, are loaded up heavy on the on the line of scrimmage they are saying to you we are here to stop your running game so we're forcing you and daring you to throw you have enough guys with with your receiving core to be able to take advantage of if defenses are coming at you with a run heavy scheme now if you have a team that uses you know like go from a single high safety to a two high a double safeties where they're covering halves of the field and everybody else has quarters and they're covering those things now you got backers that are going to take their their hook drop zones or their their buzzers you have corners that are going to sink back they're going to play from depth and they're going to keep the offenses in front of you that's now where you have to have the ability to get the ball to Ezekiel Elliott, and Ezekiel Elliott has to pull the defense forward to you in order for you to be able to now start to run intermediate to deep passes with your offense. Your offensive line can create those holes for you to be able to get into those gaps, and you can create some spacing where the defense isn't going to be as comfortable and confident with pressuring your quarterback 
it creates opportunities for Dak to be able to see windows of opportunity with those, you know, with the big Blake Jarwin or with C.D. Lamb running in the slots. Now you're creating a balance. I think McCarthy has the ability now, and I think he has personnel that understands what he wants to get done schematically to be able to find this, this cat and mouse game and find the balance of when to call what, when to align in different things. You might see a lot more shifts and motions, um, a lot more hard counts. A lot of these things are based off of familiarity. It throws defenses off. If I'm changing your alignment right before the ball is snapped, it may change how you're playing the pass. It may, play, it may change your leverage, how you're playing the run. There are a lot of different reasons why Mike McCarthy can be as effective a play caller as he has been in the past, and he has guys in Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott, Amari Cooper, now C.D. Lamb, now Jarwin. You have guys who understand what he's trying to get done. The more they understand what they're trying to do, and it's not just I'm calling in a play, the better your offense can be. And I think the familiarity between McCarthy and his group is going to be the reason why so, I, I think they take a major step LeVar forward. LeVar just lobbed me a meatball, Broussard. I'll, 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 I'll knock this out of the park. Okay. Gotta take it. Uh, they basically returned everyone on offense that was there last year. Okay. Uh, Mike McCarthy was the coach last year. What was his early? Year? Hold on, hold on. What early year? in the season. What year? His first year. Okay. okay. Early in the season. Okay. No, all that great stuff you just talked about was not evident. They were blasted are, in the first half to sit down by with, almost everyone. With, are we going to sit down and have a dinner at a four or five star restaurant, or are we going fast food? Fast food is first year. More, more often oh, so than not, so we're chalking it want, up to first year. People okay, want you to bake a uh, bake a um, an amazing meal and and cook it up in in a short amount of time. So now sometimes we're looking it at happens, McCarthy. Sometimes it doesn't. With two back to back awful years, his final year in Green Bay when his quarterback hated him, that they was didn't a different, talk. That's a right. different. That's and a then different his first scenario. year in Dallas, where nobody could get on the McCarthy's same page. McCarthy's got a lot to prove. In the first he five, does. McCarthy has a ton. But and, he has and, already proven a and, lot. And hard knocks is starting up, and I'm just in the back in the day. From Jerry and the spotlight is going to be big. McCarthy, we know he can get shaky in front of the media. I, LeVar, I'm, I'm glad you have confidence. a Super Bowl on his resume. Well, a decade ago? How many Super Bowls we got on this panel? How, how let, yeah, let, me, let me let What me back, have you done for let me Let me back up J-Mac. Go ahead, back I, I'm going to say something I haven't ever said in my life, nor did I think I'd ever say. Let me back up J-Mac. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, But McCarthy, that's, look, taking a chance right he now. did a lot of that back in the day, LeVar. And I get he was a very good coach back in the day. His last few years with Aaron Rodgers, that offense struggled considering you had such a great quarterback. Matt LaFleur comes in there. What happens? That offense gets better. So McCarthy. I bet you Aaron Rodgers wishes look, he's he got had the Mike Super McCarthy Bowl. back now. You can't. No <laughs> way. What? No, I no, I, I, doubt, I, I, I highly now. doubt that. No. I bet you he does. I highly doubt that. LeVar, you have to admit, there's no, a chance I, I think that, as Chris like said, LeFleur McCarthy when he first got has there. not changed as the league has changed. He hasn't really adapted. Listen, right. they came out last year and were blasted. They were one of the worst first quarter teams in, the, in September. Look, I mean, the numbers don't lie. You could talk football 101 and McCarthy's history, but the numbers don't lie. He was bad last year with a stacked deck. In September, Lavar, I don't know how I, I don't know how you have so much confidence well, in the guy. I don't I don't know that it's having so much confidence is to say, and I'm, I still believe a resume is a resume. I mean, maybe we shouldn't be on air based upon things that we've done in our past. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like both of you have been great in your past. I don't know how good you are on this show today. You know what I mean? Saying what you're saying. So if we're judging based off of currency effect, then, you know, they need to get two more guys in here with me. But but looking at what you guys have done in the past, I love y'all's resume. So this all works out. I can trust y'all's what y'all are saying. But the reality here is, Mike McCarthy is a proven talent as a coach. Maybe he had some down years, that's for sure. He didn't have the greatest year in his inaugural year with, with the Cowboys. I understand that. But when I look at what his coaching DNA is and understanding how he has the analytics to support and back how he approaches what he does, I lean more towards looking at him being able to get this offense in the right positions and make the right plays. And sometimes, guys, it just really simply put, 
comes down to guys making plays. It's always going to be players over, uh, over plays in the end anyway. So are these guys ready to go make plays? Are they ready to accept the challenge? Because that's ultimately what it comes down to. And I was joking. I think you guys are I, excellent at what Yeah, I thought I hit for the cycle on <laughs> the show yesterday. I'm like, geez, producers no, it, love me. I'm getting all these accolades all on I know, Twitter and Instagram. I just had to get that pressure up off of me. All after I know is we're, me, we're, you know I mean? <laughs> we're not the ones that called the Cowboys defense the purple people. Oh, no, he's going with every good defense ever. All right, no mercy. Kyler Murray and the Cardinals are looking to make the playoffs for the first time since 2015. He and coach Cliff Kingsbury roll into a critical third year together in Arizona. The Cardinals coach recently said, quote, our conversations now are more about philosophical things, team-oriented things. What do we need to do as a team to get better, to get this fixed? Lamar, what do you expect from Kyler Murray in his third year? You know, I expect more balance from Kyler Murray. I, I think that at times he relied a little bit more on his athletic ability and athleticism. And I'm one to really be very sensitive when speaking on using your athletic ability as I was one of those players. They said all he was is a little bit of athletics and he wasn't a football player. Well, I think that there is brilliance in utilizing your athleticism. There's also brilliance in understanding what's going out there and going on out there on the field. And I think that Kyler Murray coming into this season understands a whole lot about what defenses are trying to do um, to him and to this team in particular, schematically speaking. I think Kyler Murray also understands what, what his coach in Kingsbury is trying to get done and why he's trying to get it done. And I think that the more understanding that you have on why a coach is trying to position players here, like it has to be precise, understanding those things. Why are we putting DeAndre Hopkins three yards inside of the hash? Three yards outside of the hash. Why do we have him on the numbers when the ball is on the opposite hash? All of those different things that maybe philosophically you didn't understand why or take the time to really think about it. You don't understand why the play is breaking down. You don't understand that what part of the route you're supposed to be thinking you should be letting that ball go. You hold the ball for a couple seconds longer than you should, maybe one <laughs> second longer than you should. And now you're taking off and you're running. This offensive line didn't take great care of Kyler Murray at times during the season last, last year. Kyler Murray has to understand schematically why he's doing what he's doing. And I think that knowing what it is that he wants to do, adding some old guys like we've been talking thing-wise for this show, adding old guys. You add A.J. Green to that, that receiving core. Hopefully, we don't know what Larry Fitzgerald, at least I haven't gotten any reports back yet. Maybe somebody's gotten something different, but I'm not sure what Larry Fitzgerald is doing this year. But you got A.J. Green. You got uh, obviously have uh, DeAndre Hopkins on on this roster. You add James Conner to your backfield. And even though he wasn't great for the Pittsburgh Steelers, I think that that's a, a interesting addition to watch he does have weapons that he can utilize and 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 really really create some more opportunities for himself so for me i think the biggest thing is what i first said is understanding philosophically exactly why guys are aligned where they're aligned how the defense is going to align based off of where they're aligning what you look for and how you create uh basically compromising situations with the defense and taking advantage of those things when those plays are called. Yeah, I'm pretty much with you, LeVar. Um, I, I really like Kyler Murray. Uh, first half of last season, man, the dude was awesome. Fell off a little bit in the second half. So I, I think some of what you said is applicable because I think he'll be a smarter quarterback this year and that'll help him sustain his level of play. You mentioned all the weapons he has around him. That's great. DeAndre Hopkins helped him big time last year. Now they have even more weapons. So I expect that to help him. But when I look at the second half of last season, and I don't want to say some teams figured him out to some degree, but he was down in everything. I mean, wins. They went 5-3 and three over the first half, 3-5 and five over the second half. His, his completion percentage was down. His yards per game was down almost 40 yards per game. His touchdown to interception ratio was down. Uh, his, his passer rating was down 10 percentage points. His, uh, his rushes, his rushing was way down. Six of the eight games that he rushed 
for 50 or more yards were in the first eight games, first half of the season. So I need him to sustain it because he was looking like a dynamo in the first half of the season, but then he began to slow down over the second half. And I think, like you said, being more cerebral will help him sustain it over 16 games. I don't think he'll be a pro bowler like last year. Uh, I don't think he should have made it over Tom Brady last year, but I think you'll have Rodgers, Brady, and Russell Wilson in the NFC. But I do think he can have a better year than he had last year. Yeah, I like the Arizona Cardinals to get to the playoffs next year. I am bullish, extremely bullish on Kyler Murray. Uh, Chris, you articulated it well. First half, he was incredible. But you forgot to mention the injuries in the second half of the season. And he could not run. If you look at that Patriots game, it it's sore. on YouTube. He was banged up. And the Patriots strategy is what everybody did. We're not going to send our ends up the field and really pressure him. We're just going to stay at the line of scrimmage and contain him. And Kyler Murray, because maybe because of his size, could not deliver from the pocket. He's a great quarterback, but without the legs as a threat, he's a much diminished figure. That All that being said, I have someone uh, very close in the organization. They love Kyler Murray there. They like Cliff Kingsbury. This is a team on the uptick. Rondell Moore, uh, you know him well, LeVar. Yeah. Big Ten guy. That's a huge addition for Cliff Kingsbury. But Kingsbury, I think, is the bigger focus than Kyler Murray. Because I'm telling you guys, Cliff Kingsbury needs to come out of his comfort zone. What worked for him... Back in the day, in college, worked early, and teams adjusted. Defensive adju adjusted. Kingsbury, he doesn't move around DeAndre Hopkins. You, you, you made a good point, LeVar. There was a heat map last year where, like, 90% of DeAndre Hopkins' targets came from, like, the same area on the field. And defenses are smart in the NFL. They noticed that, and the Cardinals became predictable in the second half of the season. I am extremely bullish. I like the A.J. Green. I like Rondale Moore. As long as Kyler Murray is still a threat with his legs, and Chris, those running numbers are scary, because if he's not running, it's like, eh, is this guy going to kill us? I like the Cardinals as a playoff team in a, in a brutal division, LeVar. Just really quickly, I, Kyler Murray can throw from the po pocket. He can be a pocket-passing yeah. quarterback. But I think it also comes he down to, to, again, understanding where, where your windows of opportunity will be. And that was something that I think became a little bit more evident and more apparent to defenses that maybe he wasn't as far ahead as he needed to be on understanding where his looks and where his reads, first read, second read, third read would be. And understanding that creating those moments with an injury situation where he's not going to move as fast. He's depending on his legs because he hasn't quite gotten to that cerebral approach of how he's going to find his receivers or to even just throw it away in those situations. I think he'll be much better in doing that this year, and I think it will keep defenses a little bit more at bay as to how they're going to prepare for this Arizona Cardinals offense. Tenth best odds to win the MVP award. No mercy. Carson Wentz will reportedly be sidelined five to 12 weeks with a foot injury. Colts have Jacob Eason and rookie Sam Ellinger to rely on for the time being. Last year's starter, Phillip Rivers, took the team to the playoffs before retiring. Yesterday, Rivers told the LA Times, quote, I'm just going to stay ready. LaVar, you wisely said yesterday the Colts should go after Rivers. How likely is it he suits up for Indy next year? I don't know how likely it is that he suits up for them, but it would be a, a sensible decision. It would be a practical decision. And for Carson Wentz, it would be the best decision. I think if you go after other guys, you risk the, 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 the chances of pulling in a guy that disrupts the chemistry of what you've already been working on this offseason since making the move to bring Carson Wentz in. Carson Wentz is probably still dealing with some some post-traumatic situations. I won't say syndrome because that's too strong. I don't want to disrespect but, but he could be dealing with still um, some of the lasting emotional uh, letdowns and, and buildups from what he went through in Philadelphia. I think you have to treat this with sensitivity. The best way to treat this with sensitivity is to bring someone in that can lead your team, that has proven they can lead your team, that has familiarity with everybody there in the organization, and has no, no expectations to continue on into the future being the lead guy at that position. So when Carson Wentz is healthy and able to come back and participate, it's his job to take. I think that Phillip Rivers, if in the best shape, 
could be that. But I don't know where he is health-wise. I, I obviously would not be having a 24-hour ticker on what, what uh, Philip Rivers' health is and where he's at in terms of his conditioning. But I would say if he is able to come back and suit up and be able to lead this team until Carson Wentz is healthy enough to come back, it would probably be the most practical, sensible approach for the Indianapolis Colts to try to stay competitive during that time that Wentz is out. I agree with everything you said, LeVar, but I would feel better about bringing, bringing back Phillip Rivers if he had answered the question yesterday by saying, hey, I'm in shape. You know, I'm working with my team, and uh, if I get a call, I'm ready. I'll think about it. But he didn't say that. He said, you know, maybe after the season. I'll stay in shape, but maybe after the season. What is that, late October, <laughs> November? Some point in November? I mean, depending on how t far his team goes in the playoffs, so if, if by the time we get to November, first of all, Carson Wentz may be back. Secondly, the Indianapolis Colts could be out of it. We talked yesterday about how tough their schedule is opening up the season. Their first five games, Seattle, Tennessee, uh, the Rams, Miami, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could be one and four at that point. And then by the time he's ready to play, they could be out of it, so why would I bring him in then? Plus, is he willing to come in for the minimum? Or what kind of money is he looking at? So I don't think it's going to happen. Like I said, I'd have felt better if he'd have been like, hey, I'm in shape. If they give me a call, we'll see. Yeah, if, this were, if this were a bad franchise, I would say go out and get Phillip Rivers. But Chris Ballard has crushed the draft in the last few years. I'm not giving up a pick to trade for anybody. And I don't love bringing in Rivers. Uh, Chris, I, I, I agree with you. The schedule is brutal. Four of their first five opponents made the playoffs. Let's just say Rivers comes in and they open three and one. Okay? Let's just say that happens. And then Carson Wentz is like, all right, I'm back. I'm ready. Can I get the job back? And they're like, you know, Phil's playing pretty well. We're going to keep him in there. Then you've got like a quarterback controversy. I think Frank Reich really wants to give Carson Wentz a chance. I think he trots out Jacob Eason. Let's see what this guy got. He's a fourth rounder. He's a former highly touted high school kid. Big arm, not too much else yet. But I think you just do that. And I'm not saying you punt on those early games, but there's too much that so could go sideways. Like well, too much could go that, sideways. That's called words coming out of <laughs> both sides of your mouth. That, I, I, you, I, there you is did kind nuance. of just say, just I see what happens. nuance is allowed on the show, LeVar. All right. No mercy. Kevin Durant and Team USA look like they found their groove after eliminating Spain in the quarterfinals of the Tokyo Olympics. They'll be looking for some vengeance against Australia in the semifinals. If you remember, Australia beat the USA 91-83 in a pre-Olympics contest. Chris, will Team USA avenge their exhibition loss to Australia and make the final? Yeah, I'm going to bet on Team USA. I think they'll be able to slow down Joe Ingles. Yes, I said slow down <laughs> Joe Ingles. Uh, he, he, he looked like an all-pro uh, when he played against them in the in the exhibition game. So I think they found their groove in that. I don't know how many teams internationally can handle their pressure defense, particularly on the perimeter. And then once they start hitting shots with Durant, they're tough to beat. So I got Team USA getting revenge. Of course you got Team USA. It's a practice game. We're talking about practice. We ain't talking about a real game, gold medal round. We're talking about an exhibition. That's practice. Uh, of course they're going to win the game. And again, they're going to win by double digits or more. What's the line, Jay? Ten and a half. They're going to blow ten and a half out. It's going to be at least 13, 14, 15, maybe even more points that they win against Australia. You nailed the Come Spain. Come on, talk about now, it. Now, I will say, Australia would have a better chance if they hadn't beaten the Americans. Revenge on the mind. Uh, just be careful inside, though. Australia has some bigs. Jock Landale uh, is tough. I, I know Chris is like, who? Um, who? But the USA does not have... Bam Adebayo is playing terribly. He was awful against Spain. I just worry a little bit about the interior. This is a so, smart Australian team. Um, it, we, it'll be we close. Got no size. I'm right not enough. betting on this one. I, I can't wait for Luca hey, versus Mike. the U.S. in the final. They ain't got it today, Ooh. Mike. Hey, Mike, they ain't going to win that the game best tonight. Best player Mike. in the NBA <laughs> against the Team USA. That's going to be a great final. Hey, guys, it's been a great show. Another Take my winning bet, show. J -Mac. J Mac dominating. LeVar doing well. Chris needs to lay, Take raise my your bet. level, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>